this week's program, we're going to be talking about why your medical insurance has to go up every year and what we can do about it, if anything. Also, we're going to be seeing what FAR is doing as far as their latest involvement with science and research. And in just a moment, we're going to be talking farm accounting. Kerry, it's fair to say that some farmers never learn. No, it's, if they're an employer, they just seem to think they know everything and can flout the law. Um, and again, we're reporting that we've got another, there's another dairy farmer in New Zealand that's been caught um, underpaying his staff. So he employed a couple of migrant workers. Um, they said they were underpaid. He deducted living costs from them, so he's deducting rent and power from his wages. Uh, they weren't happy, so they complained to the Labor Inspectorate. Uh, so this triggered a big investigation and the Labor Department came in, asked him for his records. He admitted he didn't have an employment agreement, he didn't keep any records, um, he had no authorisation to deduct the costs, and so he's been hit with $20,000 worth of costs. Is it a fact, or is it sort of a situation where people say the immigrants aren't going to kick up? So I think they, they think that, um, but <coughs> they're pretty clued up. Um, you know, they come into the country, they've got friends working elsewhere, they've had people that have been here in the past, they know what's happening. Um, they get a feel for how many hours they're working and what they're getting paid and whether they're getting the fair rate. Um, and there's plenty of information available on the internet. You know, they, they do get in there and do their research. So if you are employing staff, you just got to be so careful. In fact, I think probably you yeah, just don't try to take advantage. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, employment agreement, just give your accountant or lawyer a call. You know, both parties can do it for you. Don't think you can get away without having one. It's a necessity. It's by law, you've got to have it. If you don't have it and something goes wrong, well then you're on, on thin ice and you're going to get done no matter what you've tried to do to protect yourself. And you mentioned this chap didn't have any records. What sort of record should we be keeping? Well, you've got to keep a record of the hours they've worked, um, what leave they've had, what sick leave they've had, their holiday entitlements, all those sort of things. He didn't keep anything. Um, tried to say well, he had them somewhere but couldn't produce them when asked for it. So that was another nail in his coffin, basically. Um, you know, any modern payroll program will keep that for you. Uh, if you really want to keep it paper based, well, go and get a wage book from from the bookshop, basically. <laughs> go see um, Paper Plus. <laughs> but really, with the way the employment lawyer is, it's better to go electronic um, rather than trying to do it paper based because there is too many things that can go wrong. Now, how many people are now leaning on accountants to do that because it is too complicated with all the different it's things? It's going up and up. Um, we're getting three or four inquiries a week for people that want us to do their payroll, and I'm talking to other young accountants, and they're all finding the same that employers want to hand that responsibility off knowing there's an expert that keeps an eye on it, keeps them on track. So, you know, we recently had someone put a staff member on, they put them at a pay rate that was under the minimum wage. So straight away we're able to tell them, look, sorry, you've got to put them up to this rate, you've got no choice, and get them back in compliance with the law. So how does it work? Do you, you're sitting in your office, does somebody electronically send you a list of employees and the hours they work? Yeah, it depends on what happens. So some will just send us electronically, Others will get their staff to ring up, and, you know, farm manager, for example, around and say, hey, I've got this staff member work this many hours. Um, others fill out timesheets and send them through. So it's all different means. Depends on what each person wants to do, and, and accountants are adaptable. That would basically take the pressure off you, wouldn't it? Because instantly, it's, it's like trying to do your own tax return. The minute you try to do your own, then land revenue go, hello, hello, hello. Exactly, yeah. So, <laughs> and, and, you know, for example, when someone gives it to us, we keep all those records. We produce the proper payroll records um, with a pay audit. So if anyone comes here as a look, you just, we just hand over the file and they go, okay, everything's there basically you can look at. So you do the withholding and, and PAYE yeah, as well? Yeah, we do the withholding tax, PAYE, um, and then at the end of the month, well, we notify the employer, this is what's due on the 20th to pay and, and they just simply make the payment, all the paperwork's filed for them. And when an employee leaves, you're able to say, well, this is what it's going to cost yep, you for holiday do, pay. We do their final holiday pay calculation. Um, if employees have a question at any time during the year about their sick leave, holiday leave, they can get a figure right up to date rather than sort of the employer scrambling around trying to make it up sort of thing. So what you're suggesting is that if you use your accountant, you can actually get on with what you do well, which is farming. Yes, definitely. Yeah, and, <laughs> and you don't have to worry about all the compliance side of it. It takes the risk away. Yeah, well, that's the minefield that we could talk about for the next <laughs> yes. three hours, but the minefield of that. Now, let, let's move on to farm houses and that minefield. Yeah, um, now, up till now, um, a farmer could get 25% of the farmhouse expenditure straight away as a deduction against <coughs> income tax. Now, IRD have come out with a new interpretation statement, and that's all going to change from April next year. So it's a fair way off, but they've come out with it now, um, big changes, and people have got to be aware of it. 
So they've said the part-time, full-time distinction's gone. The 25% automatic deduction's gone. Um, they've broken it down into two types of farms. So we've got type one and type two. And it all comes down to the value of your house compared to the farm. So if your house is 20% or less of the farm value, then you're a type one farmer and you've got one lot of rules. And if it's 20% or more, you're type two and you've got a basically a harder way of doing the farm deductions. So once again, it comes back to chartered accountants, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Um, so yeah, you know, type one farm is pretty straightforward. Yep, it's so what we've got now basically, but you only get a 20% deduction. So it's slightly less to claim. Um, and the, not sure why they want to get in that trap, but they've done it. The type two comes down to basically a home office type situation. So <laughs> it's going to be a lot more work involved for your accountant basically to get that sorted. And this is this is the main homestead you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, the, the one that's occupied by the, the owner of the farm. As opposed to the ones that have got yeah, so your staff, on. yeah, that's a different situation. It's, it's your main home. So, you know, some farmers do build quite a, a big home, a brand new one, and it can get quite a substantial cost. So that could put them from one type into another. So they're going to have to be careful. Um, and you need to be talking to your accountant if you're going to be doing that sort of thing because you've got to think about the implications for tax, um, whether you need a valuation to keep you within the the type one that you want or if you're going to fall into the other one. <laughs> and then you've got depreciation and you've got... <laughs> and, there's a, it's, and there's a few other little complications I've added in as well in terms of rates and interest, but um, yeah, again, it comes down to the type of farm. Because you are allowed a percentage on, on a percentage, aren't you? Yeah, you are. So um, at the moment, 25% of all costs. So if you've got your power, your insurance, that sort of thing, you get a flat deduction. But moving forward, um, if you're type two, for example, and you only got 10% of your home occupied as an office, then you only get 10% of the costs. So it could be a big reduction in claim. Briefly, tax refund has changed. Yeah, you, you'll see a lot of media advertising these tax refund companies. Um, basically, we're saying to people, if you've got no people on salary wages or they've got staff on salary wages and they want to know whether to get a refund, don't use them. Um, they're going to charge you a fee. You can go onto the IRD website and do it for nothing. Well, that's a short conversation. Yeah, it's nice and simple. It's just, they get charged quite a substantial fee, especially if you've got working for families. Um, these refund companies take a slice of that as well. Whereas if you do it through IRD, they don't take anything. It's a free service and you get all your entitlement paid out. Is it simple enough to follow the IRD one? Yeah, um, they've got a link on their main page. You click on it and it takes you through a few questions. You can <coughs> you set up a, a login basically with them and you can do a calculation before you get that refund. And of course they pay that straight back into your bank account. Yes, and bank accounts are another little trick. So if you've used a refund company in the past, make sure you update your bank account with IRD first because otherwise it'll go to them and they'll more than often charge a, um, an admin <laughs> fee to refund it to you. Yeah, that's a weird, that, <laughs> that could make you grumpy. Yes, um, I know of someone that they, I think they had a $25 fee for, um, when they did their own return this year and tried to argue it in the refund company. said, well, we had to pay it to you. It took our time, so tough. End of conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Kerry, thank you very much indeed. In just a moment or two, we'll find out what's been happening as far as FAR is concerned. So today we're at the FAR Church, the Arable site, located in mid-Canterbury. Uh, we're here post-harvest, so it's looking nice and green. Not too many trials in the ground at the moment. But each year we have uh, an irrigated and a dry land column and we research all sorts, including we have our CPT, our serial performance trial here, on top of herbage treatment trials and yeah, some other stuff as well. So in December we have our big field day. Every second year we have a crops event and every in-between year we have our area event where we have uh, close to 700 people attending, so yeah, a lot of people. So the long-term cultivation was, trial was set up here back in 2003 and after an initial phase of bedding in we've got 10 years worth of data and it was set up initially to, to look at the yields under different cultivation treatments as well as their economic viability um, but we're now also focusing on the soil aspects and how the soil is reacting under the different cultivation treatments. So we have six treatments here which are replicated four times uh, and then we also have an irrigated block and a dry land block. These treatments are also split up into intensity of cultivation. So we have an intensive cultivation, a minimal cultivation and uh, no-till, so no cultivation. Treatments here for the intensive cultivation make use of a mullboard plough 
and then worked with a top working uh, implement and our no-till treatments make use of direct drilling uh, where we use a cross-slot drill or a double disc drill. Uh, in terms of yield, uh, the biggest impact has come from irrigation, which is a fairly obvious one. Uh, in terms of the cultivation treatments, the biggest impact we've seen is in the dry land scenario, where no-till treatments have produced the highest yields in eight out of the last ten seasons. In terms of the irrigated blocks, it's been difficult to identify one treatment as constantly achieving the highest yield. <clears throat> Another interesting thing we've seen is the water holding capacity of the soil changing. In the no-till treatments, we generally have a higher water holding capacity, and this is also greater under the irrigated compared to the dry land. So Craig Dragarther from Plant and Food Research has been carrying out our soil measurements since 2004, where he's carried out these measurements 2004 through to 2009, and then again in 2015. Things he's looked at, things that he's looked at are soil compaction, uh, soil structure, uh, the biological health of the soil, the total nitrogen and carbon in the soil, as well as the soil water holding capacity. So this is an example of aggregate stability which has been used at the site to measure the, so uh, to measure the soil structure. Um, here we've got some samples from the no-till treatments and from the intensively tilled treatments. Um, I'm going to put some water through them and what we should see is the different filtration rates happening. So first I'll go for the no-till and as the water goes through there should be greater pore space in amongst the different size uh, aggregates allowing the water to flow through fairly quickly. And then, and then in the intensively tilled treatments these pore spaces should be a lot smaller, there should be some compaction, so the water should slow, flow through a lot more slowly and build up on the surface. This is the type of scenario that can lead to crusting as well, where, which makes it very hard for the plants to emerge. So over the last 10 years of the trial, the results have really become a lot more evident and the trends more so in the last couple of years with the 2015 data set showing these trends a lot more strongly than in the first couple of years of the trial. So under the irrigated treatments we see about a 3% increase in water holding capacity in the soil compared to the dry land. With the soil we have here at Chertsey, we know that that equates to about an extra millimetre of water holding capacity in the soil. So if we were to say have 15 rain events with a millimetre or more over the irrigation season, that soil should be able to hold an extra 15 millimetres of water, which means that's 15 millimetres of water less you have to apply via your irrigator. It's in FAR's plans to continue this trial for the foreseeable future, uh, continuing to assess yield and to also look at ways that we can identify how to continue to improve the soil's health. Insurance is a deadly thing that we have to have. But, Hank, everybody is getting their in use with the health insurance and it seems to go up very quickly. It does. There's, there's lots of ways that insurance goes up on an annual basis. Everybody's insurance, their life insurance, their health insurance or their disability insurance has a right of renewal every year once the policy's been issued. It's automatic. But because it's done on, a, on an annual basis, every year it goes up according to age. So 12 months, we're 12 months older, we're another year older, we're another year theoretically closer to making a claim. Um, because we're higher risk. So as we get into a higher risk situation, uh, the insurance companies charge us more. So every year it goes up. 
This year, uh, we've had a little bit more increases, uh, particularly around medical insurance. So part of that is also the expenses or what it costs the insurance company. We saw it with house and contents insurance, um, you know, after the earthquakes, mm. uh, they all went up in price because there was a, a, a very large number of claims. So it's the same with medical insurance. More people have medical insurance, more people are claiming. Medical expenses has gone up, is on, the, is on the rise, and therefore the premiums go up on a general increase across the board. And it's a bit like uh, petrol going up. One insurer will put the premiums up, that's sort of like an excuse, if you like, for the others to be able to follow suit. So although they don't collaborate in their premiums, uh, it is a competitive market, but if one has to go put their premiums up because of those expenses, the others generally follow. So in the last 12 months or so, a lot of people have found that their premiums have gone up more than normal. That's part of the reason. Barbara Lee, do people get anti when the medical insurer is throwing money into sponsorship of whatever? Well, that's right. That's you know, a bit of a red flag, really. Um, companies that are spending all of that in their marketing budget uh, you know, there are other companies that don't do that and therefore their, you know, premiums are a lot more efficient uh, because they run a more efficient ship. Uh, we don't all need to have that uh, level of marketing uh, just for awareness. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm insured with, with a company with, through a broker, who, but they're throwing buckets of money out into yeah. television and I'm going, oi. <laughs> no. yeah, so perhaps I should actually have, have a look at, at, at reassessing that. Yeah, absolutely. There's lots of options out there, um, and they're all very different. Uh, you know, when it comes to medical insurance, you know, um, there's lots of options, and we have um, access to risk researchers, which we can show people how the companies rate, the products rate, and why we might be choosing a particular company. It's a um, nice, transparent sort of process. Hank, is it easy to change companies? Not always. It depends on circumstances. Uh, Pre-existing conditions will very much determine whether you can shift or not. Uh, it's a bit like uh, insuring your car and having it crashed, and before, even though that crash might have been fixed, there may be something wrong with that car, so the new insurer is not going to take responsibility mm -hmm. for what's happened in the past. It's much the same with medical insurance. If you've got a pre-existing condition, a new insurer is unlikely to cover that. I'm not saying they won't, but they will look at that and they'll, they'll do a due diligence over that claims or those pre-existing conditions they had, and that'll make it extremely difficult. See, Barbara Lee, I mean, I've had two hernias. Now, they've both been fixed, so that shouldn't be that shouldn't be a problem because it's been fixed. Well, it depends on, you know, your medical notes, what they say, and also an amount of time where you've been treatment or symptom free. Uh, so they sort of have a time frame on different different types of events as to when they might, you know, take a look at that and give you full cover and return. Uh, but, you know, when you say that, you know, medical um, premiums have gone up a lot, there's lots of ways that we can manage that as well. Mm. Um, so there's options that we can go through with mm. people and uh, with a goal to getting that premium down to something that's affordable because really we, the key thing is to keep that cover in place because it's so valuable to you. Uh, since you've taken it out you might have a, a new condition that means you wouldn't get cover elsewhere. So rather than just cancelling it uh, because the premium's gone up, you know, give us a ring and we can talk about the options and help you through that. I think the important thing is there are options. So if we look at, if we liken it a little bit to, to, to car insurance, because it is very similar in many ways. I mean, it's just a vehicle that we're insuring. Um, the, the, there are options out there to be able to mitigate that to a degree. For example, if you've got an old car that you can't afford a whole lot, and so and, and our first car, Dad would have said to us, get third party insurance boy because at the end of the day if you hit someone else at least you're not going to be paying that off for the rest of your life. There are similar options within medical insurance. You don't need a very comprehensive insurance. What you need to do is you need to make sure that you've got the big events covered. You know those joints that are going to wear out as we get older so you don't have to wait in the public health system or have to pay or get bumped all the time or go into a situation where there's overcrowding in a, in a hospital environment. Mm. You've got choices. So the ability to have like a, almost like a third party insurance um, it is certainly available and certainly so a minimum, a minimum mm. cover. Minimum yeah. cover. So I, would, I wouldn't, risk. sorry. Well, it helps you cover your biggest risks. Correct. You mm. know, if you can afford to have more than that, that's great. But you know, if you, it's the minimum, those, those big ticket items to have those yep. have it available. 
you know, wouldn't you want to have access to a surgery if you were told you had to have, uh, you know, surgery rather than be on a waiting list, which could really affect you? <laughs> I'm sort of chuckling because, because I know your reaction is going to be Hank because I've had four operations in 20 years and never in, in those 20 years I haven't claimed on a car. Yes, yeah, st <laughs> statistics tell us that we've got more chance now of claiming off our ha health insurance than we do off our car insurance. It depends <clears throat> a little bit where you live. I think if you're in Auckland where there's a lot more vehicles and, the, and, there's, and there's probably a greater chance of having 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 a, a motor vehicle accident. But at the end of the day, statics, statistically across the board, we've got more chance of claiming on our medical insurance uh, than we do in a car. I mean, uh, we talked about this before. In the last 20 years, how many times have you claimed on your car insurance? No, I haven't. How many times have you claimed on your medical insurance? Four. Four. <laughs> Four. And what's your most precious asset? You know, your car or, or you? <laughs> Me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely right. So, so. so Barbara Lee, if somebody wants to, to look at changing, are, are you able to talk to them, put a proposal into one of your insurance companies? Um, and then assess whether they want to pick it up or not. Exactly. Once you have an offer presented to you, then you can choose, well, is that, you know, to my <coughs> betterment or, you know, am I better to stay where I am? Um, but we certainly wouldn't put them through that process unless we thought we could make um, a difference to them in the first place. And, and it depends on the condition. Mm. If you've had appendicitis and your appendix are removed, it's never coming back, is it? No. No. So... Uh, yes, you might get an exclusion for appendicitis, but it's irrelevant. <laughs> it's a, it's it's a nonsense. Yeah, it's sort of yeah, it is really. So so it really depends on the condition. It really depends on 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 the, the individual concerned. It may be that they have a pre-existing condition that has been fixed that they're not concerned about. They're mm -hmm. not worried about that. We're worried about what's going to happen in the future, but the bigger events. Put the line in the water, and yeah. find out what's what's out there. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, there's a lot of people out there with um, medical insurance that have got. Um, conditions already excluded on them, yep. which have never been reviewed yep. uh, and are reviewable and they could be, you know, possibly taken off their policy. So, you know, if you do have that kind of thing on your medical policy, it's great to sit down and, and just go through that again. Yeah. Indeed. So the bottom line is, when it comes to health insurance, go to see your broker or your agent such as these two and find out what is out there and also update it because a penny saved is a penny earned. And after the break, we're going to be looking at some of the stories we've already done this year because, well, it's winter and it's nice to be able to look back over the summer and the brighter days, isn't it? Bowen therapy. Now, Claire, the first thing I want to know is what is Bowen therapy? Um, Bowen therapy is a, basically a fairly gentle form of body work and we're working mainly with superficial fascia. So that's, Which means? That's connective tissue that runs throughout your whole body. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's around everything. So if you took the rest of you, everything else away in your body and just left the fascia, you'd still be able to recognise who you are. So the fact that it's like that means that we basically can communicate with the whole body by doing little moves on the body surface. So Claire, what are you actually looking for? Uh, structural alignment and um, any muscles which appear to be more tense on one side than the other. The body doesn't um, function very well when it's not correctly structurally aligned and this form of therapy is very good at helping the body to correct that alignment. So to me already, I'm thinking this is a cross between massage and chiropractic. Um, yeah, it's funny because people always want to um, compare it with other modalities, but really it's, some, it's a unique um, modality. I mean, it's the same in that we're trying to correct the body's dysfunction, but you can't say, is it like massage? Not really, because massage goes with the muscle fibres. We go across them in a single moves rather than repetitive type of moves that you have with massage. And chiropractors are basically working on the spine itself and trying to correct the dysfunction by realigning the joints, whereas we release the tissues and then the muscles will realign themselves. So, I mean, sorry, the, the joints will realign themselves. What's this particular person's problem with, it, with their left leg? Um, she, she, there's nothing wrong with her leg, she, but we treat the whole body. Her problem was initially um, upper back and neck discomfort, pain, um, but Basically, that's a result of the rest of the body not being structurally correct. So often you have like um, 
you know, we talk about victim, victims and criminals, so the, the victim is usually the bit that we feel is sore, and the criminal is the silent, silent bit that you don't know is causing that problem. And this is why this therapy is so good, because we're treating the whole body, we pick up things that might be causing the problem, which is, could be a long, long way from where you've actually got, got the pain. So. <laughs> So back into the, the lower back area. Yep. That's amazing because you, the, you're right, there's, there's no massage and there's no sort of bone cracking. It's very gentle. We're just releasing all these um, the tissues or we're giving the brain signals to come along and initiate the, its own re release basically. A lot of People suffer from tight backs, tight necks, leg problems, of pain shooting down because of stress. That's very real. And this is actually able to, and I'm using layman's terms, but it's got to one not all that, that stress and tension. Definitely. You know, it's, it almost seems like it's too good to be true, and, <clears> and it is. Um, it's an amazing form of body work. So how long would, would a, 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 an establishment like this, how long are you actually on the bed for? Uh, around about an hour. It's, it's very specific to what that person needs on that day. So I, I um, don't charge per hour, it's per treatment. And it could be anything from half an hour through to an hour and a quarter, depending on what your body needs on that day. So. Do you find that blokes are prepared to come and stretch out on your bench? Oh, definitely. <laughs> if they, if they um, you know, can realise they're going to not have pain, they'll be here too. I also use this Biotron light which I'm just going to bring in um, as part of my treatment. It's a um, second modality but it combines really well with, with the Bowen therapy. Um, and basically this is, this is working on um, just visible light with different filters and each filter has a different wavelength and therefore a different vibration and it's the vibration that we're using as a therapeutic. So okay. this, this is not like the old heat ray lamps that we used to use a million years ago? No, it's, the heat is, it just runs at um, body temperature. Um, so it's not heat, it's, it's, the, it's the vibration that is, is um, therapeutic. And what I'm going to do is start with stimulating the whole spinal column. So we do um, some light at the top of her um, base of the neck and then down the sacral area and that will stimulate the whole spinal column. That's not heat? No, it, it does feel, some people say it feels warm, depends on what your body's interpretation of that colour is, sometimes it can feel warm, sometimes it can feel cold, sometimes feel, people feel nothing, so it's just what an individual feels from it, but it actually does run at 37 degrees, so it's fine about body temperature. And you're fixing people? <laughs> I'm, I'm enabling people's bodies to fix themselves, basically. Now duck shooting, when did you start duck shooting? Well the first photo was when I was about four years old, all camoed up in the Mai Mai, but I think we were out there as soon as we could, as soon as we could get dressed up in a jacket, Dad would take us out to the Mai Mai and we loved it. We loved the hype, we loved getting out there and getting involved and I wanted to shoot a gun as soon as I could. so. We were, uh, we, were, we were shooting almost before we could walk. <laughs> We've come a long way because the old days of just putting a hat on and wandering off to your my yeah. mind, now there's all this amazing gear. Definitely. I mean, now you've got to, I mean, it's recommended you have camo paint, you, your camo gears, your motion decoys. All of it is going to help you get one more extra bird, one more extra, extra target. So it's definitely worth it. It's definitely worth all the goods. Innovation. You've mm. got decoys that, that do all sorts of things now. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we have the flashing splasher, the swimming mallard. The, the ducks are attracted to movement in the pond, so as, if you can get movement, if you can get a motion decoy which disturbs the water, and that's what attracts the ducks and gets them in. So not just having a stationary decoy, actually having movement in the pond is what you'll see increase the birds coming in. Is there much demand? Because it used to be a, a religion almost, but now it doesn't seem to be so strong. Oh no, it's definitely still a religion. You'll have your regular customers which will come and come in and spend up. You don't know where the money comes from, but this duck shooting season I think is such an amazing sport. 
um, for so many people to come together. You've got families that come together for a day. You've got old mates that it's what they've done for 20 years. It's the one day they all get together. It's a, it's a really, it's an amazing day that you, I, I don't think we realise how many people participate in Dark Shooting Season. It really brings people together. It's, well, perhaps that's my, my perception because, <laughs> you know, I haven't been out for, for years, but it was a very, very big event. Yes, it's a huge event. It's a huge event. I forget the numbers off the top of my head, but it's phenomenal how many, license, how many licenses we sell and how many people participate on opening morning. It's one of the biggest. I think it's actually the most participated sport in all of New Zealand. More people go duck shooting on opening morning than play rugby in New Zealand. The lead versus steel, there's a lot of people walked away when, when we had to use steel. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends. I mean, of course, when you've, when, a lot of people don't like change, but nowadays steel is, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of options out there which you, will, you, will, you can definitely still shoot and kill birds effectively with steel. It's finding the right combination between brand, ammunition, what your gun is, where you, what your choke should be. It's definitely still effective. Obviously lead is going to be more effective, it's heavier, it's more malleable, you will have more killing power, but you can find equivalent, if not, not, not so much equivalent, but a, a, very good, um, a very good second best in steel. So perhaps somebody should come in here with their shotgun and talk to the gunsmith? Yes, definitely. Or one of the salesmen here, we'll, we, can, we can definitely help you out with what choke you should use, what ammunition we recommend in steel. Um, there's many different brands and many different velocities and we'll, we'll, we'll find a right combination for you. Because that's one of the things that I found was mm. I thought, what choke do I use? And I didn't want it to go bump and, and not work or whatever. Well, there's so know. many different aspects of duck shooting and, and what you, you know, what, what ammo, what choke. There's five different chokes, there's six different sizes of, of duck ammunition. It's, 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 it can be quite confusing. As far as the guns, have they changed very much? You're obviously a, a Beretta <laughs> fan, but... Yes, Beretta, Benelli. I mean, I think what we find is that the same brands are, are, are kind of um, sprucing up their models. So the models over the last 20 years have been, have been much the same. Now the Beretta A400 with the recoil reducing stock, that's come out in probably the last five years. It's a really, really great gun. Um, your Benelli's, they've had a very, very similar gun over the last 20 years. Um, so the guns are still are still the same. You'd, we're dealing with two different types of operation, gas and inertia. And so we've got many different brands that fit within that. And tell me a bit more about this camouflage thing. <laughs> you, you, do you turn up with those on the morning or do you set them up beforehand? Well, it depends. A lot of guys will build a, a standalone mine wire. You know, they've, they've spent their, the last month preparing with, with camo nets and everything. But we do have the blinds, which are so easy. You just set them up like a tent and they unfold instantly. And that's really handy if you've got quite a few people shooting in the same place and um, you want to spread out. Or because they're mobile, obviously, you can change your position during the day if you're finding where you are isn't working. So it's really handy. And especially for those people that don't have time to build their mai mai. You've got single chair and double chair and you've got quad blinds, so it's amazing the, um, the camo blinds that we have as well. And of course those decoys that I'm still chuckling about. <laughs> yes, the motion decoys, honestly, it's really worth it. I think once you give it a go and you see how well they work in the environment, you're blown away. You, what, you wouldn't shoot without one once you've used one. And the circling ducks? Yes, the circling ducks, they're my favourite. One year we set them out at the back of the Mai Mai because we didn't have room in the front of the Mai Mai. We were wondering why all the ducks were wanting to land at the back of the Mai Mai. They attract the ducks so well, they are so attracted to movement. So it's really well worth having a movement decoy. And one last shot for we who enjoy mm. duck shooting, it's not actually murder, it's actually culling. It is. I think, if, I mean, it's really amazing if you get into the conservation of duck shooting. You know, the ducks, they do, they can destroy the waterways, they can eat a lot of the feed that the farmers want to conserve. There's a whole lot of things um, that are benefits of, of duck shooting for our environment. And we, we, we do, we have an, an outrageous amount of numbers of ducks and we need to cull them. We're helping the environment. Now we go to the dentist normally about every six months, but what about horses? What are the problems that horses face dentistry-wise? Um, well, the main problem is that they have what we call hypsodont teeth. And what that means is that their teeth grow to a certain length, um, and they have what we call this reserve crown, and it sits up inside the skull, and through the lifetime of the horse, this tooth will wear off on the surface, 
and it will keep erupting into the mouth. Okay, So this is a really good design for where horses are intended to live, which is a very dry, semi-arid environment. But we have taken horses out of that environment and put them into our domestic, very soft grass type of um, situation, which isn't the best for their teeth. And what happens is you tend to get um, irregular wear patterns with those teeth, is the most simple way I can put it. There's a lot <laughs> of tooth that's in the skull. Exactly, and that has to last the horse's lifetime. So generally you would get um, one to two millimetres of, of tooth erupting through the gum line a year, and that is the rate it will be wearing off. But if for some reason a tooth doesn't have opposition, that rate can increase a lot, and you get what we call hyper-eruption, and teeth can become quite protuberant. They stick up and they cause blocking problems. Um, the other thing is that often horses won't use the whole of the surface to grind with, what we call lazy eaters, because our food is quite soft. And then you get um, parts of the tooth left that hasn't worn away that should have. So most of our work is actually taking away um, tooth that should have worn away in a natural situation. So what are you looking for? Are you looking for spurs or are you just...? Um, basically anything, like the teeth should form a nice arcade row of teeth and anything that goes outside that row is a problem for the horse. And the reason being, like when a horse eats, we've got this lovely skull here to demonstrate, <laughs> its jaw basically goes down, out, up and across in a circular motion. And this horse can't do it because it's locked and it's also dry because it's a skull. Um, so we've got this circular pattern going on. So anything that stops that mouth from being able to do that rotation smoothly is a problem for the horse, not only in its eating but also in its comfort. And it also interferes with the way that the horse can perform when we ride it. The mouth needs to be able to go sideways for the horse to be able to turn its body and flex, flex through the whole body. Um, if it can't do that, um, it will have various ways of getting out of it, which usually become problems for us as riders. The other, other thing, for, um, so we obviously need a side-to-side -side motion for the horse's mouth. And the other thing is it needs to be able to go backwards and forwards slightly with rostral corner movement. And um, that's just, it's about that much, it's a very small amount of movement. But if it can't do that, it's going to be uncomfortable when it's being ridden and it won't be able to perform, perform pro properly, like its hind legs won't come underneath, um, it'll hollow, it'll throw its head up. It's, they've got lots of different ways of getting out of doing what we want them to because they're not comfortable if the mouth can't function. So what are you looking for when you open the mouth? I'm looking for no sharp teeth and nice uniform sets of teeth going through the whole arcade, basically. We go to the dentist six monthly, yep. or perhaps annually. How often should a horse be looked at? Um, when they're young, they should go six monthly too. So from, we generally say two and a half or before they're first ridden, and that's generally just taking off sharp edges. But at two and a half, they start to change their baby teeth, and that's when they can start to get problems if their teeth aren't shedding at the same time. We can get this hyper-erupting problem that I was talking about before. To so, me, it's astounding that the mouth can control all its behaviour. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a comfort thing. If they're not comfortable, then it's going to affect the way they hold their body, and then they'll start getting tense metal muscles back through parts of their system. So that's going to become uncomfortable, and they'll start moving in different patterns. So it's not just about comfort within the mouth. It's about the whole body. It also obviously affects their digestion. I mean, if you've got... Um, particles of grass that are not being chewed properly, they can call it quite easily, things like that. So yeah, it's, just, it's the whole body. So before we start, you're going to find out externally where there could be problems? Yeah, well you can just find out that there are, yeah, definitely something going on. So we just tend to look at the symmetry of the horse's muscling, its head, um, come down the side, something people can do for themselves if you just feel up under here. So he's going, don't touch me there because it's got sharp edges that are sticking into his cheeks. Um, if I come into the side from here and just gently put some pressure on there. The ears have gone back. Yeah, he's not too bad at something, he doesn't really like it, but this side he's, he's very much don't touch me there. So that straight away to me shouts dental problem before I even look in his mouth. And then I would tend to open, open up the lips and just make sure we've got six teeth top and bottom. And if you come round behind me, you'll see, you'll see that he's actually got what we call a diagonal bite. So his teeth are longer on the top on this side and on the bottom on the other side. <laughs> and don't touch me there. <laughs> yeah, and he's like, just pretty, pretty much leave me alone all over, over my mouth, really. So, so you're a vet and you're yep. going to tranquilise or, or quietly sedate the horse. Sedate the horse. Yep. Why is that important? Um, lots of different reasons. For a start, we want to make the process kind of calm, safe for both the horse and everyone else concerned. Um, so we want to get them in a happy place so that we can make it a good experience for them. Also, when we're putting the speculum on, which opens up their mouth, when they're sedated, 
you can get it open, you can examine the whole mouth, you can get right to the back of the mouth. What we tend to find is when we don't have them sedated, a lot of times the horse is trying to fight you, the horse is potentially restricting the access to the very back of the mouth. And so to get a really good thorough job done, we want them calm, we want them happy with what we're going to do as a procedure and we want to evaluate the whole mouth and get to the back of the mouth. Um, and it tends to be in most horses, we have to get them sedated for that. Not everybody does it. Is there, is there room for every horse to be sedated? Yeah, I mean, it depends a little bit on what they're going to have done. Sometimes you can do kind of routine maintenance of various areas of the mouth without too much sedation. But to really evaluate the whole mouth, um, you need to have them sedated to get to those areas. So we would recommend, in general, to do a proper evaluation with sedation um, and getting the whole mouth examined at least once a year. If you've got one small access point to do, you might be able to get it done, but realistically, you need to get the sedation to get that full exam, um, and as Claire said, once a year or thereabouts, just to make sure everything's evaluated and everything's done. Now, I saw that you checked the heartbeat on this particular horse. Yeah. Well, we use it as an opportunity to go through like a routine healthcare check for them as well. So, you know, one thing when we're when we're sedating them, we're putting a drug into the system, we want to make sure that their heart is healthy, that there's no heart murmur, that there's no arrhythmia, anything that the drugs we're putting into them would affect. The other thing is it's a good it's a good opportunity for us to evaluate other things in the horse, right? To make sure that the heart's good, make sure that there's no other health issues that we can address just on a routine basis. So it's it's kind of like a warrant of fitness for them as well and so we can use it for the horse's benefit in other ways as well. So you're just sedating it, there's, there's no problem, it'll come out of it with a grin all over its face? Yeah, I mean it, it just keeps them kind of sleepy, they don't they don't lie down, um, sometimes they stumble a little bit when they get to find their balance, they've got four feet and if they put them at the four corners they find it a little easier to balance, sometimes they sway a little bit, but yeah I mean it's, it's a pretty easy procedure for them, they just have a nice sleep, chill out, enjoy the procedure. So basically what he's got is this, I was talking to you before about how they don't use the whole arcade to chew all the time. So he's got an angle to that part of his tooth and then it gets longer as you go towards the outside and that's what's stopping him getting across. And then as you go right to the back, he's got just little hooks on the back really. It's quite sharp on the outside and he's got quite a bit of what we call um, enamel ridging. So all these ridges up and through here, all these ridges going across the tooth, can you see that? Yeah. Um, they shouldn't be like that. That locks that backwards and forwards movement. So we need to take those out. So the teeth actually grind really well um, when they're a lot flatter. They're not designed to have be all rough and bumpy and lumpy. It's a bit like a mortar and pestle. Smooth surfaces grind really well. They actually get their grind from the angle of the arcades of teeth, not from lumps and bumps on the on the teeth. So you've taken the the rack out for the one of a minute or two. What yeah, I've done next? what I call the bulldozing because so I've <laughs> gone and taken all the high teeth and the sharp edges off. And now I'm going to do the incisors while well, we've got good sedation because for them that's the worst bit. Yep. The incisors at the front tend to be they're just a single rooted tooth and they vibrate quite a bit while we're working on them. They don't really like it because you can't say, hey, we're trying to help you here. Um, so well, fix this up that, next. It's not going to believe you. <laughs> and then I'll go back into the, the back and finish off once I've done this, I've got this sorted out. So this is the front bit so that the, the top in the bottom can move across. Yep, I mean I want to correct this diagonal bite but I've already got the lateral excursion in the back. You can see how his teeth are being pushed, like the alignment should be across here and his jaws being pushed way sideways. I've taken off all the sharp edges and even out the high points in the back of, back of the mouth and any teeth that are protuberant and then I've been and worked on the incisors and corrected the wedge, the diagonal bite for as much as we can for the source at this point in time. So basically he'll be a different horse now. Yep, we've given him back full function and that's going to make him comfortable and his whole demeanour will change, he'll become a much happier horse, he'll be able to make better use of the food that he gets, his weight will increase, he will perform better, he'll just be a lot more laid back basically. When do you want to see him again? 12 months. And it won't be such a big deal in no. this stuff. Definitely not, but I will still get him sedated. The problem with horses being done unsedated is that the teeth right at the back of the mouth never get done. And also the incisors don't get done sufficiently. And it is a problem for the horse.
you know, it's a bit like you wouldn't get the farrier in and get them to trim three feet and not the fourth one. But this is what is happening with the mouth all the time. You know, not all the teeth are being done. And because all their teeth are in contact at the same time, um, a problem anywhere creates a problem overall. Tony, a sale for Holstein Frisian heifers really, it's an interesting concept. Yeah, oh, well, the heifers are the young stock, so the future, so that everyone likes the newer genetics, so um, it seems to be where we, we manage to, to attract the interest now. So. Okay, these are all stock that are based around the Canterbury Westland Holstein Frisians? Uh, no, they're from Southland, there's a couple from Southland as well, so we invite anyone that wants to participate in our sale to to join us, so there's a couple from, from the Deep South as well. So tell me about the North American connection, because the, the, several of them have got North American blood. Uh, North American connection is, is these group, the breeders that we've got um, are very on about the confirmation, which is usually a functionality of a cow to try and predict longevity, so they like the, the top end of that. And North America has been known for quite a long time of, of having top confirmation animals, so these are um, inclined to chase those genetics, um, they're, they're certainly interested in the, in the high gross per cow production, and so they, these breeders sent that and then market it to the rest of the people that, that are interested in that. So. so I guess performance recording of, of the mother would be very important. Yes, that's done with the, with everybody, is, is, is the production of the, of the dam, that's a big part of everything here. But, um, and also part of what we're very interested in is, is the confirmation of the type of the animal so that she can uh, do that larger production but have the confirmation to, to last longer. You see some of the, um, some of the industry stuff, they, they are now saying that um, confirmation plays a bigger role in the more intensive operations where the production per cow is higher and also plays a part in the other extreme, the once a day milkers. Uh, they need more confirmation as well. So. so when you say confirmation, what are you actually looking for? Lots of things. Is, is, is that the cow can, can um, consume large volumes of food to convert to milk. So, so she needs spring of rib. So she needs capacity, but she also needs a uh, wide muzzle in the lungs and the heart to, to pump the, the blood to make the whole thing function. So yes, we want that, and then she needs to have that, that strength through that, that rump area to be able to um, carry herself and also to be able to do the reproduction and, and carve out every year. And then um, legs and feet is fairly important in New Zealand because cows have got to be able to walk around and, and uh, consume those feeds rather than it being delivered to her. So they need to have the legs and feet and then the memory, which is highly important to be able to use functionally get that milk out of that cow, especially if they're doing you know large volumes like these cows do. Is it hard to pick all those points on a young animal? Um, well I guess that's where the pedigree comes into it. We look at uh, the size that, that have that and then the dams and that's a big strength of the sale is, is looking at the, the dam and then the grand dam and then the great grand dam and if she's been a, a love cows that have been able to perform for a number of years that's really been some of the strength of what the breeders here like, like selling, and that's the attraction for purchasers to the sale. Is one of, one of that's the big one of the big selling points for us. And of course, the venue it's it's a bit different. You've the second time you've been here. Oh uh, well, yeah, second time we've been here, but we've been to a few venues around Canterbury. It actually started uh, when conference was in Canterbury back in '05, and we had it at the Chateau and that was in the hall <laughs> and so that was unique and that started the ball and then we, um, we've we had it in the Thai Tat pub and then we uh, ended up at Rickerton Racecourse for quite a number of years. Um, we rang the aura a couple of times and now, yes, uh, with the conference, um, the Holstein Frisian Annual Conference in Canterbury last year, they some had the idea of coming here and it, it seemed to work. So. It was, they decided they'd like to come back and do it again. So. Richard Spark makes a pretty good sandwich. <laughs> yes, well, there's a few of our local vendors have had a, have known Spark for quite, Richard Spark for quite a while, so there's a, there's a little bit of knowing each other helps as well, doesn't it? Tell me about demand. Does it vary depending what the milk price is doing? 
uh, that always has a, a bearing on what milk price is, yes. Um, availability of cash always has a big, big part of any marketing, isn't it? So. And so the, the atmosphere, you're feeling confident in, in this year's sale? Oh, I think there's been a wee bit of a, a lift in, in dairying. The confidence is, is coming back slowly, you know, it's, it's still still in recovery mode but at least you know this is as you said these are a lot of young ones so this is a future so people are investing in the future. And have people been culling quite hard because of the, the downturn? Uh, there was quite, culling was quite hard through the dairy industry um, with the downturn because at the same time uh, beef prices were, were quite high so it certainly made uh, the traction to, to cull anything that was, was surplus was um, certainly was what happened. It, it makes these youngsters very valuable as replacements. Well, we hope so. 500 if you want to. I got 10,000 bids. Bids out back. I got 10,000 bids out behind us. 10,000 once. 10,000 twice. Third and final bid. All down at $10,000 and I sell. Done. All done. Very good luck to the buyer. 10,000 was the price tag. We just thought that you would enjoy those again. Incidentally, you can always catch up on all of the stories that we do here on On The Land by going to our website, which is ontheland.co.nz. I'm Rob Cook Williams. You've either been watching or you've just missed the programme, but they will be back at the same time next week. Until then.